and I am the curator, uh, the chief bottle washer, and the security guard at the um, saxophone factory uh, here at Music Showcase, uh, here in Brandon, 402 Oakfield Drive in Brandon. So um, I think that getting a good start on playing the saxophone is really, really important. I mean, doing all the right things right first are very, very important. So what I'm going to do is I, I use, a lot of times in my studio here, you're in my studio, uh, I use the Rubank Elementary Method for Saxophone because it's a tried and true method for saxophone that's been used for years, years. Um, and I think that um, it really gives the saxophone player a really good base to jump off on. A lot of these videos on YouTube talk about uh, how to play popular music right away and, and, and sort of treat it like it's a, not a real instrument. Uh, and I think that it does, it, it needs to be treated with the same pedagogical um, significance as violin or piano or cello or trumpet or clarinet or flute or oboe or bassoon um, because it, 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 it is, is indeed, it, it has two a very, very um, proud and important um, history. Uh, the saxophone is not, like you've probably heard, not a hybrid. It's not a, it's not a cross between a French horn and a clarinet or it's not a, it, it, it isn't. It's not a jazz instrument because there's no such thing as a jazz instrument. Um, the saxophone uh, was invented to be a strong woodwind voice in the orchestra. Because when it was invented in the mid 1800s, there was no, there were no jazz bands, there were no blues bands, and that's not what it was invented for. Um, that's a a common, a common uh, misnomer and uh, misconception and false narrative of a lot of people who, <laughs> amazingly enough, went to music school. Amazingly enough, went to music school, uh, and a lot of people think that that when you talk about saxophone, that's what you're talking about. You're talking about primarily a jazz instrument. Uh, primarily a, an instrument that's that's loud, primarily an instrument that doesn't blend well, doesn't play well with others, when the fact of the matter is that the saxophone is, is the instrument that plays the best with the others. Um, the sax the character of the saxophone through mouthpiece and reed changes and embouchure changes can blend and be with uh, the quietest of, of chamber ensembles um, to the most raucous rock bands. Uh, the saxophone is one of the most flexible instruments there is. Um, so te teaching it in a, I'm going to use this term, a classical way, a better, a better term is a traditional way, is the best way because it gives you a great foundation to jump off on. You know what, here in my studio, I tell my students, I'm going to teach you how to play the saxophone. Then you can play whatever you want. I'm not going to teach you how to play the jazz saxophone. I'm going to teach you how to play saxophone. So if you want to play jazz, cool. If you want to play show tunes, cool. If you want to play rock and roll, cool. If you want to play uh, death metal, cool. If you want... No, not cool. But if you want to play um, bop, cool. If you want to play uh, West Coast, cool. I mean, you can do whatever you want. Play pop, cool. But let me teach you how to play the saxophone first, which is why I'm starting on with this book. And it's, in, it's, down, in the, it's down in the description box. Uh, the Rubank Elementary Method for Saxophone is a very traditional way to start playing the saxophone. Very traditional. Um, so we're going to do it for, we're going to go through it first. Uh, and at the end of that, we might go back and do something else. We might, I'm thinking that for a jazz series, maybe we go back and play the uh, beginning of the Lenny Niehaus Jazz Conception book. It's a great book, been out for years and years and years teaches swing, teaches a bunch of this stuff, and it's really cool. All right, so we're going to start today on lesson one of the Rubank elementary method for saxophone. Um, hopefully in the picture, let me see if I can take the picture. Yeah, I'm experimenting. Can you tell? Experimentation, this is the cool thing about YouTube, experimentation is completely allowed and encouraged. There you go. I just took a picture of it. Hopefully it'll work. How about that? Let me take another picture. There you go. Um, hopefully in the screen next to me, you can see what I'm playing. But hopefully you'll have a book, your book, your own personal copy of the book 
um, and, I, and you can see where to get it in the description box below. Um, order from Amazon or go to your local music store and ask for it. This is lesson one of the Rubank Elementary Method for Saxophone. At the top of the page you'll see it says whole notes and whole rests. Whole notes are a type of note. Um, I've already done, and you can check out here, uh, my note chart um, that tells you the relationship between the notes, between whole notes, half notes, and quarter notes. Um, and it mentions time signatures, how to, how to read time signatures as well. Or, so you'll know um, what these are. Across the top are the definition of staff. Staff is simply the, the, the numbers, of, the, the lines and the spaces that we read music with. There are five lines and four spaces. The bottom line is called E. Isn't that interesting? I think it's interesting because, wait, I hadn't intended to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's the coolest thing about doing this. Um, that on the guitar, the bottom string is called, let's see if I can do this without making a mess. The bottom, the, the bottom string is called E. Right? And on the staff, the bottom line is called E. Okay. Now the next line is called G. The middle line is B. The next line, the fourth line is D. And the fifth line is F. Now, some of you have learned uh, a little acronym that you, that you, that people use uh, to memorize that, and I don't use that because it takes too long when you get in a hurry to use that. It's much better to take the time to memorize what the names of the lines and spaces are, in a, in, you know what, so you can access them randomly. You don't have to go through the whole thing. You don't have to go, every good boy, uh, you, you don't have to do that. You can just look at it and go, oh. Like the first exercise is a B. It's a whole note, and in that, in that C, thing you see there is a C, and that means common time, or 4-4. Four, four. That's also explained in the video. That's in the I there. Um, so it gets four counts of sound. The thing that's next to it in the next measure is a whole rest, and it gets four counts of silence. Make sense? Four counts of silence. All right, now... How do you finger that note? How do you make the saxophone make that sound? Well, I'll tell you what. This key right here, the first pearl. Now, some of you may have a pearl here, but the, the, the very, very top pearl, or this lever, is you press it down, it's kind of heavy. The first pearl, that, that's the B, operates a lot more light, it's a lot lighter. That's the first note. That's the first note. Okay, we're going to talk about embouchure for a second. I'm going to do a separate video on embouchure, but we'll get you started on this one. So you don't have to go to the other one first. Uh, what you want to do when you're, playing, when you're playing the saxophone, you want to tuck your bottom lip just over your bottom teeth. Kind of like, kind of like this. Not, not, not like this. Just kind of like this, kind of tucked over. And you want to put your top teeth on top of the mouthpiece. Let's see if I can see that. You see, it's just sort of tucked in gently to create a, a cushion for your bottom teeth and your top teeth on top of the mouthpiece. And you want to pull the corners up forward as if you were saying the syllable ooh. While keeping your bottom lip tucked in. Make sure no air escape here. Push your first finger down to finger the note. Keep steady air pressure. There you go. Easy enough, right? Easy enough. All right, here we go. We're going to play. Now I, now I know you're ready to play. You're all chomping at the bit. So now we're going to play. Um, we're going to play number one. 
on lesson one of the Rubank Elementary Method for, for Saxophone. Here we go. You can follow along in the um, in the picture that's up there somewhere. Hopefully the edit works. One, two, ready? Easy enough? Easy enough. All right, now we're going to play um, the next note, number two. We're going to play that, and that's an A, because it is on the A space. The second space is called A on the staff. That note is fingered with the first two pearls, actually the first and third pearl, because there's a, there's a little baby one here that we're going to skip for now. There's a reason for it, but we'll get to that later. Okay, we're going to skip there, and it's the first two big pearls. Okay. I commonly call it one and two, okay? So we're going to play that. It's the same rhythm, four counts of sound, four counts of silence, four counts of sound, four counts of silence. Here we go. One, two, number two. <laughs> And there you go. The B was our first note, which is the top or the beginning, and then the A, which is right after. Okay. The, the, the next and the next exercise takes us back and forth between those two notes. The A and then the B and then the A and then four counts of silence and then the B, the A, and the B and ending with four counts of silence. Here we go. Number three, lesson one. One, two, ready? <laughs> Easy enough, right? No, no worries. Not very difficult, is it? And the, and the trick is to make sure that you keep a steady airstream so the note continues, the, the right note continues to speak. And it doesn't horrible on you, right? So make sure your embouchure is not, it's firm, but not tight. And your bottom lip stays tucked in because if it gets poked out, it'll, it'll create a sound that you don't want. It won't be the nice, smooth, blendy, you know what, sound that blends and, and, and is beautiful. It'll be a more raspy sound. And right now you don't want that. All right, let's go to our uh, number four. Um, which introduces our third note, and our third note is G. G is fingered. We we know that the B is fingered with the first finger. The G is fingered with the one and two, and if we add the third finger, one, two, three, we will have a G. Make sense? Sure. Here we go. Let's play the, the G, four counts of sound, four counts of silence. One, two, ready? <laughs> Easy enough, right? Easy enough. Now, in general, before we do the other exercises on the page, if you have trouble, pause the video and go back and work on the exercises. Okay? It doesn't, you, doing, it, doing them like this doesn't mean that you have to go as fast as I go. If you can't go that fast, stop it, practice it, get it better. Um, because the idea is that all we want to do every time we play is get better. There is no best, because all of the really good players, all they want to do is get better. So the, it's like the universe expanding. It always gets better. It always gets better. And what you want to do is get better with it. All right, so that's, that's what we're doing.
Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and do number five. And from now on, we're going to go right through the rest of them pretty quickly. Remember, you can always stop, rewind the video, and practice them, and then go back and play them. This is not a race. Number five, starting with B. One, two, ready, go. <laughs> There you go. Easy enough. Again, keep the air going. Nice, even pressure. Make sure the embouchure is firm but not tight. Make sure the bottom lip is tucked in. And make sure that your top teeth stay on top of the mouthpiece. So it anchors the top of your head onto the mouthpiece. So it makes sure that you can have a fairly relaxed bottom jaw. All right. Um, so you mean Eddie Lockjaw Davis is just a nickname. That's not who you want to be. All right. Um... We're going to do number six now. Number six, number six, uh, on lesson one of the Rubank uh, Elementary Method for Saxophone. Lesson number six. One, two, ready? <laughs> We know we know the B and the G, and the, and, and the hard part is making sure when you go from one note to the next that you don't reset. And what I mean by that is when you play the B, you don't you don't have to lift off the B and then play the G. Because that's a common that's a very common mistake. People play the B and then they lift off and they reset. When you play the B, just put down the other two fingers and play the G. It's more efficient. It sounds better. And basically, it's the right thing to do. So go ahead and do that. All right. Now we're going to play number seven. Number seven introduces a fourth note, a fourth note, C. And and I'm going to say it that way because it's not a new note because C has been around for a few thousand years. So uh, uh, a um, it's a um, fresh note for us. It's a fourth note for us. And C is fingered by depressing the center key of the pearls. Here we have this. This pearl, we have the baby one, which we said we're going to skip. This, the second one and the third one, we're going and we're going to play it with our, with this finger here. The finger next to our index finger, which is the center one, and we'll call it two. This is one. This is two. This is three. We're going to play it with two, alone. Now, something important that I want to tell you now is that your thumb. Now, you're wondering what to do with your thumb. Well, the thumb, you see this, the black part here on the back of the saxophone? You see that right there? That's the thumb rest. And for some of your saxophones that may be older, it may be brass. It may be the color of your saxophone. But for most of us, it's a, it's a plastic piece, black piece on the back of your saxophone called the thumb rest. And it's my thinking that your thumb should never come off the thumb rest while you're playing the saxophone. Um, you can tell by the design of this instrument that it's curved so it's ergonomic so your thumb is actually going this way when you're playing so it should just take just the top part just the top part of your thumb to operate it makes things a lot more efficient and I, I promise you if you do that first while you're learning to play later on it will not be a problem because if you don't do it I promise you later on it'll be a problem I'm trying to help you just trying to help you. Well, let's play number seven, the C. Remember, it's just the second finger. One, two, ready, go. <laughs> Now, the number eight is, um, it alternates back between B and C. Now, that's important because you have to make sure that when you're going back and forth from B to C, that you can do it quickly 
as to not get a middle node in between. Remember, I just told you about adjusting um, and, and resetting by going, because you, you don't want to go B and then C, B and then C. You just want to go B, C, B, C. Make sense? This is one that you will want to stop the video, practice, rewind, hear it, practice it, hear it, practice it, hear it, practice it until it's clean. And I'll tell you, you'll get huge benefit from doing that. Here we go. Uh, we're going to do number eight. One, two, ready? <laughs> Again, you want to make sure that it's clean going back and forth. All right, number nine. Number nine incorporates, you know, what encompasses all the notes that we've learned from C all the way down to G. Again, make sure that you don't reset. Make sure that you just put down the correct fingers right away, um, and you shouldn't have any problems. Again, if you have to practice it, please practice it. Practice it a number of times. This is not a race. This is this is not. Who gets bet? Who, who gets better faster? This is just this is just hoping that everybody gets better. Here we go. Uh, number nine. One, two, ready. <laughs> Now, number 10. Number 10 is cool because it sort of skips around a little bit. Remember what I said before, um, how it was important to, to learn the name of the lines and spaces sort of randomly because you, so you can pick them out like this? Because music doesn't always just go up one at a time or down one at a time. Sometimes it skips around. And this is the first exercise that, that kind of skips around a little bit. So we have to be able to recognize the notes right away. Now, when I get done... I want to tell you not to do something that you may have already done. So it may require an eraser. Because I can read your mind. Here we go. Um, number 10. One, two, ready, go. <laughs> Although the first couple of exercises, numbers one, two, four, and seven, have the name of the note written over the, the note in the first measure, I'm going to tell you that it is a bad idea. I was thinking to tell you that it wasn't a good idea, but the fact of the matter, it's a bad idea to write the name of the notes in over the music. Now, I know when some, sometimes maybe you've learned another instrument, that's how you've done it. But if you've done it that way, that's why you're still struggling on reading the names of the lands and spaces. Do not, under any circumstances, write the names of the notes over or under the notes on the staff. Because I'll tell you what, you will read what you wrote and you will never learn to read music. And if you never learn to read music, the downside of that is that you will not be able to share readily um, the gift and the language of music with other people. Now, I know this video was a little longer than I had anticipated, but a lot to say. All right, well, we, we're going to see you on the next video where we, we talk about half notes and half rest. Um, in the meantime, you might want to, um, let's see, up in one of the corners here at the end will be the video on note values. You might want to review that before you do the Lesson two on half notes and half rest. See you in the next video. Bye-bye now.